okay, I'm ready. Okay, well, I'm going to hit the record button and you can just go straight in. Recording into it. in progress. Hello, Dan Winter. <laughs> Hello, I'm so happy to be with you. Roger, that uh, talk by Scott Olson just now was so stimulating. Really, thank you. Uh, and uh, I have some uh, fun ideas about replying there. So, so this talk, uh, at Roger's suggestion, is about uh, superluminal propulsion, advanced propulsion. But that becomes uh, an arena within which to necessarily do a fairly deep inquiry into the nature of gravity, which is what be, is behind propulsion. And the nature of gravity obviously has to do with the nature of fractality and implosion and all the fun things we've been talking about, including Scott just now. And uh, well, a couple things to mention. Um, first, uh, when physics talks about how action at a distance is due to entanglement, as Scott also mentioned, that entanglement perfected obviously is uh, embedding perfected, you know, our famous embeddability monitor. <laughs> and um, embedding or nesting perfected is the problem that golden ratio solves by definition, but also then is the problem solved by phase conjugate golden ratio fractality or phase conjugation perfected. And thus, now we know that when physicists says that action at a distance uh, through what they call an Einstein-Rosen bridge wormhole uh, is in fact entanglement, we know that that embedding perfected is what phase conjugation does. And phase conjugation produces the longitudinal wave, which is the subject of our superluminal and action at a distance conversation today. So the fact that phase conjugation produces a longitudinal wave that goes through that wormhole is most directly the subject of the conversation today. So physicists already agree that the perfected collapse, which they also call entanglement perfected, they all agree that perfected collapse is the solution to not only gravity and consciousness. There's almost no physicist who would argue if you said perfected wave collapse is the solution to the unified field, as is practically a quote from Einstein saying perfected charge implosion. So perfected wave collapse, they all agree, is the solution. And most physicists are already willing to say that fractality causes gravity. What no physicist, uh, until our work, I don't think, has actually described accurately in meaningful wave mechanic terms is how fractality and entanglement or perfect wave collapse causes gravity. And that's what we're about to answer in detail and thus describe the superluminal components of propulsion. For example, why when you go through faster than light, once you are that longitudinal wave, it is generally at a golden ratio multiple of C, the speed of light, as in fact uh, Professor Raymond Chow has already measured. So perfected wave collapse as the core to the nature of gravity then gives us the clue not just to the superluminal component, but actually to consciousness itself. Now remember, we're always talking about perfected wave collapse as the golden ratio in three dimensions, which is what the dodeca ecosystellation is, which as we'll see is how the <laughs> atomic table is put together. And we had the beautiful image yesterday uh, in uh, Tufan Guven's talk, cube octa, ecosa, which is also dodeca, and octa and tetra. That, you know, from the day that we, I worked with Bucky personally for months on that actually, and uh, he was talking about perfected wave collapse, but didn't understand that anytime you talk about a number, the fact that it is a number only has meaning if it predicts what a wave is going to do. That's why so many people get lost in numerology, because to know the difference between numerology and physics is to say that you only escape from numerology, which can be very uh, fractionating, when you have predicted what a wave is going to do. And in fact, it, it's even only meaningful to predict what a wave is going to do if you predict what an electric field is going to do. So you see the resolution of the confusion of numerology, which is beautiful, and pattern recognition, which is beautiful, but unfor unfortunately many woo-woos get quite lost, uh, is to say, understand that you must use it to predict not just what a wave is going to do, but what an electric field is going to do. And then you have tra transcendent numerology into physics, and you're no longer a woo-woo. Not, not that that's a criticism, because many of the spiritual people are so focused on beauty, and that's a beautiful thing. But um, 
the reason I wanted to do that is now it's it will get visually a bit technical. We're gonna have a lot of pictures here, but I wanted to start with a a uh, a poetic and a, a sort of Sufic version of our inquiry into gravity and therefore superluminal propulsion, and that's why I'm starting with this slide. Let's see if I can do this correctly. So hopefully you're seeing my uh, let me get this let me get this screen over here. It came up okay, Dan. Oh, good. Okay, I'm just getting me in the frame. <laughs> so, th this is a famous paper, William Henry. He was just, uh, exploring the fact that the astonishing wormhole dance of the whirling dervish is actually an introduction to physics. And that's why we're inquiring why every guru says, if you want to develop your consciousness, track your center of gravity through your feet to the center of gravity of the center of the earth, and then to the center of the gravity of the center of the sun, as, for example, my teacher Bentoff did quite successfully, and you become the center of gravity of something larger. And the relationship between gravity and consciousness is that they are, in fact, identical. It's the center of charge implosion which produces both. And you're being able to ident I phi <laughs> with that imploding center. So ask yourself the simple question, um, why is it that the dervish proves he has pure intention if he does not get dizzy during the term. That is a profound inquiry, which is a very useful, the fact that you've proven to your Sufi master that you have pure intention if you can make the turn without getting dizzy. So the fact that you've produced gravity is a proof that you are a shareable wave, pure intention, all that good stuff. So I'm just suggesting a little meditation. So the, the idea is between the not slipping and the slipping knot is that there is a certain lock point between the rotational and the centripetal inertia, as uh, we frequently describe in the seven color donuts. So the reason the relationship of the rotational inertia to the centripetal inertia is the relationship between gravity and electromagnetism specifically. Once you know that rotation of charge has a period named time, and rotation of charge has inertia named mass, so rotation of charge is the only definition of time and mass. So now you understand why if you accelerate, you, there's a change in your age. It is because it affected the spin rate named time because of the translation of vorticity. And translation of vorticity optimized by definition is the golden mean spiral, which is the term used for golden mean spiral in hydrodynamics. But just a little acknowledgement to... Uh, to Scott here, really enjoyed your talk, Scott. <laughs> but the, the microtubule connection to the gamma waves uh, is so wonderful. And I love that you described the uh, icosahedral mouth of the microtubule uh, as golden ratio, and therefore the eyeball of the tornado. That is a gorgeous thing. And that it was linked to the gamma waves. You know that the our work, flameandmind.com, first of all, you also mentioned golden ratio in brainwaves, which we've been doing for a lifetime practically. It seems like flameandmind.com teaching golden ratio in brainwaves and bliss. But the point when we talk, teach young people to see without their eyes, it's the cascade of golden ratio harmonics in brainwaves to gamma specifically that identifies the moment that they're blindfolded and a wormhole appears inside their head and they say, I can see blindfolded through a tunnel vortex. And that plasma tornado obviously is the physics of consciousness. And as we said, no one knows what the physics of consciousness is unless they've explained why consciousness causes charge to compress. And they can explain why consciousness can project outside your head, the net of fireflies inside your head, the synapses that make the vortex tornado. That vortex tornado is not limited inside your head. The plasma donut can exit your head and where it can go is the loci of astral projection actually. And we now know that that is actually the nodes of longitudinal interferometry which is where lucid dreaming can go. So uh, this is the base slide for all of the conversation today and you've seen this a hundred times but that when the vortex, remember all of mass is simply vortex uh, toroid, uh, including the atomic table, that when the vortex line up accurately enough that phase conjugation is perfected, then the transverse inertia entering on the left emerges compressed precisely through Planck by golden ratio into a longitudinal wave, sometimes called a gravity wave, and also the collective unconscious. So the ability to propagate the compressional or longitudinal wave from phase conjugation is precisely the cause of gravity because gravity happens because 
the transverse wave on the left uh, is a rotational inertia, and a part of that inertia locked in the ratio of the rotation to the centripetal force uh, travels precisely down the golden mean spiral on the 60 degree cone of phase conjugation, something called, called the caduceus. And that translation of inertia from transverse to longitudinal perfected is what allows the charge to escape at center. And that's why the adding and multiplying of phase velocities, which is the cause of gravity that only golden ratio allows, because the phase velocities adding and multiplying produces acceleration of charge towards center, sometimes called the gravity. Remember, gravity is only a name for charge acceleration, and mass is only a name for charge rotating. So the ability to produce gravity at that threshold called Planck, the, where the pine cone kisses, uh, is precisely because there is a way out for charge at the center of implosive compression, namely into the longitudinal array, which is why planets and stars experience gravity relations erotically, quoting Gurdjieff, and why orbital mechanics, solar system, and interstellar masses are all based on golden ratio dodeca. Because gravity waves are never stable unless, because the longitudinal nodes only can exchange inertia at golden ratio compressional fractal nodes, so to speak, a fractal field.com. So this, the way in which gravity waves are experienced erotically is an introduction to the physics of gravity, which is longitudinal interferometry, which is necessarily fractal, which is the only place the nodes can share compression and exchange the longitudinal inertia with the transverse, and so you can talk to ancestors at those nodes, and you can extract zero-point energy at those nodes, and at the Earth grid node cross points, there's the measurable reduction in nuclear critical mass, per Bruce Cathy's measure. So this, uh, here's a practical example. If, you, this, if that sounded abstract, here's a practical example. Supposing you're among the physicists who've been using the EM drive famously, and you're making gravity, except you don't know how or why you're making gravity. Well, in fact, if you would use my equation to tune the phase conjugate caduceus cascade array of microwave inside the, the uh, trapezoidal chamber uh, so that the collapse point was accurately tuned to golden ratio of the microwave power spectra, so use my equation to predict the power spectra and my pr equation to predict the scale, Planck times golden ratio, you can, in fact, retune the trapezoidal cavity of the microwave EM drive to optimize the amount of gravity you make. However, first, you would need to know why an object falls to the ground. So, to get a sort of sense of that, that distribution efficiency, um, when the longitudinal array propagates and the nodes are at the bottom right here, so here's the little image. So that's our star mother kit, and that's a, a model of the dodeca Ecosa array, which I then proved is a structure of hydrogen, but it's also DNA, earth grid, zodiac, and every living protein. And the proven arrangement of masses in the universe is all dodecahedral and fractal. So the still point nodes of that array is the only way gravity can stabilize is because the only way longitudinal waves can propagate efficiently, which as per Tom Bearden's equations, longitudinal waves are gravity waves. So to sort of visualize that, we, we use this picture of the billiard balls on top or the pendulum in the middle right there. And if those balls were slightly separated and you dropped one ball and you, they bounced between each other, it, it could take <clears throat> a lifetime for one ball to bop, pop off the other end of a row of a million balls. However, if the balls were touching each other, precisely phase locked in a, a nodal grid array, then when you drop one ball at one end, the ball at the other end could bounce off faster than the speed of light, depending on certain densities of the balls, etc., etc. So the fact that the balls are locked together in an array is clue to how you inhabit the array. But now further to understand the... So here's the, the picture from Nature magazine, the arrangements of masses in the universe as dodecahedral, famous, the picture from New Scientist, the masses of the universe are arranged in fractal, old news. But, and on the right you see measuring gravity waves with a 25 cent capacitor instead of a billion dollar LIGO system. Hodewanek and Ramsey, they were both excellent friends. And all this is doing is using a capacitor to measure the wave front of a longitudinal electromagnetic. And you see here that they picked up star explosions dramatically measurably faster than light. Here's an introduction of faster than light propagation. Um, 
at the bottom, the clue is right there. Raymond Chow, famous, here's the smoking gun proof of my theory of gravity caused by golden ratio fractality. Measured repeatedly, uh, thousands of measurements of fast and light propagation, between 1.5 and 1.7 times the speed of light, centering rad rather accurately on golden ratio 1.618 times c the speed of light. The measurement proves the most common measurements of the faster than the speed of light velocities are golden ratio times the speed of light. The reason is because phase conjugation by golden ratio is the cause of gravity and the longitudinal waves that are the mechanism of gravity. So now that is a clue to how you get through the speed of light and disobey Einstein's mistake, which says it takes infinite energy to go through the speed of light. He was uh, patently wrong. And the fashion and light propagation then is specifically caused by golden ratio propagation of the pushing compressional longitudinal wave. So this is an introduction then to how we're going to actually introduce some physics around. Now this, this lecture is a modification of a visual series that was prepared for the Amsterdam Lectures Breakthrough Energy Movement, all at fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy. But I've modified the slideshow uh, for Roger's suggestion on longitudinal propulsion. But, you know, as we're saying, if Stephen Hawkins and your physics teacher and Einstein had been able to tell your child why an object falls to the ground, then your child could know how anything becomes centripetal, how a plasma cloud becomes mindful, that the universe is not condemned to entropy, why rapture exists, the only cause of gravity and negentropy, why negative ion and wind coal plasma create propulsion, and why 4D and 5D, the next dimension, exists are only possible when charge rotations are superposed by golden ratio, literally the door to the next dimension. So we, we need to know why an object falls to the ground before we can answer Roger's question, <laughs> which is, what is, logic, what is faster than light propulsion? And the, the, another practical example of the torus, the famously toroidal ball lightning is also famous for responding to telepathy. Now you know why. At the center of that toroid of plasma, the longitudinal communication is the physics of the conscious unconscious. That longitudinal interferometry, hey, ave, planes of Sharon, <clears throat> uh, Champs-Élysées, that heaven is a fractal field which is the longitudinal array and the title of my film on that is called Inhabiting the Array. Here's my website, most of you have seen that stuff and more about our websites. <clears throat> so the universal physics of the vacuum, the charge is a superfluid whose distribution efficiency ultimately depends on fractal conjugation. Everything is about charge distribution efficiency, charge, uh, <clears throat> high dielectric constant not just in phase conjugation, but also in the biology architecture. It's all about high dielectric, which is specifically about charge distribution efficiency. Visual evidence of fractality is key to gravity, hydrogen, and alchemy, example, introduction of longitudinal lima, why zero-point energies affect gravity, and why free energy is the wrong term. Zero-point energy can never be understood in principle until first learning why an object falls to the ground, because fractal symmetry is the source of the charge acceleration named gravity. So everybody is talking about charge collapse as a clue to gravity and the clue to consciousness. It's a beautiful question, but no one has answered the question of what is perfect charge collapse until they look at phase conjugation due to golden ratio. Then they have the answer. So the vacuum planet, infinite energy is only free if charge circulation is perfect at Tom Bearden's and Meg. The vacuum is a superfluid. You can call it ether, but the compression rarefaction of the ether is named plus and minus charge. When the charge rotates, it's named mass because it's stored inertia. The period of that rotation is named time. So time is not a mystery, and space-time is not a fabric that's bent. The reason time speeds up is because when you accelerate, spin rate speeds up, and spin rate is the only definition of time. That's why you age faster if you accelerate without carrying your inertial frame of reference with you. We're going to later learn that the charge acceleration physics that Roger invites us to speak about today. In fact, if it's done coherently, you can carry your inertial frame of reference with you, and then you don't experience the, 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 the sharp turn, and you do not experience aging. So electricity is simply a superfluid. Most of you know that. Infinite compression was even Einstein's answer to. So fractality perfected is recursion perfected, is embedding perfected, is similarity compression. This is old news. You've seen this. So compression acceleration equals gravity produced due to that fractality. And the zero point is, the th is Planck. It's the threshold at which transverse inertia becomes longitudinal. And that's why the Planck distance is the same, even if you go a thousand light years in all directions. 
That is, in fact, the only proof of the Big Bang, because it's the only proof of the unified field, actually, is the musical key signature, Planck. And so then this relates to the fact that harmonic inclusiveness perfected, which is how you identify immune health in your heart, is also the way to identify viability in any living thing. Any living thing, how long it's going to live, is predict by, predicted by how many harmonics it can embed. How fractal it is. It's proven in HRV, but it's true of every living thing. If you're not harmonic inclusive, you're toast. And harmonic inclusiveness perfected is what the problem of golden ratio fractality solves. And harmonic inclusiveness thus predicts gravitational stability. They're literally the negentropy which gravity causes. So this rest of this presentation is about the longitudinal or scalar mechanisms of gravity path to distribution. And we have pictures of some of the gadgets here. So this is the perfect flame. It's the fire does not consume. It's the blue fire. It's not just consciousness, but it's also cold fusion. And you've all seen the animations. This is the transverse wave, and this is the longitudinal scalar or compressional or torsional. And when they focus at center in symmetry, it starts with four wave mixing. This is how first megentropy and time reversal was measured in phase conjugate optics, but it's also a literal model of how the first atomic device was imploded. Um, so you must have the longitudinal waves. Transverse waves just won't cut it because they don't do compression well. So efficient plasma containment, which is the definition of cold fusion, for example, that if you can do compression without heat, which is another name for everything we've been talking about, and which is also then, it's also the definition of efficient isotope transition, and therefore the only possible physics of alchemy, non-destructive charge collapse. Another picture of that four wave mixing, you've all seen that from phase conjugate optics. And here's another sort of picture of how that works, the sacred four directions in ancient lore. But this is actually happening inside the atomic table. If you look at the S and P, the pi suborbital is this geometry. So it's all, all about pine cones kissing noses and we've told that story many times. And you've seen these slides. So this is how the golden ratio is expressed in three dimensions, cellular icosadodeca. So then getting back to our point, which is you only have physics out of numerology when you've actually predicted what a wave will do. So first, here's my equation predicting the three radii of hydrogen, golden ratio, integer exponents, type Planck, and uh, this is the first paper we published, Compressions of Hydrogen Atom and Phase Conjugation. The second paper in this series describes that as the cause of gravity. So uh, I want to show you how we develop those equations. They're called Navier-Stokes. And, uh, so, and you've all seen my master graphic here. So if you multiply golden ratio times Planck, get all the important variables in the nature that produce negentropy. Three radii of hydrogen, uh, the enzyme diphosphate, most important molecule, uh, the British foot, and the definition of all sacred dimension, which is simply charge collapse, optimized. Get the only two frequencies of photosynthesis. You get the Schumann harmonics, brainwave harmonics, the Mayer wave, Venus year, Earth year, galactic year, procession year. And this was the first perfect paper. So this is what I'm, this is a bigger view of that publication I did with uh, Elizabeth Donovan and Martin Jones. Martin Jones is a mathematician. Point is, it was the Klein-Gordon equations which allowed us to prove that golden ratio waves on a line are the universe's generalized wave mechanics of the most possible constructive wave interference. This is the only reason golden ratio is interesting. Everything else about golden ratio fits into this point, which is golden ratio by equation is proven to be the maximum constructive wave interference. We did that first on a line, and then, of course, no physicist knows how gravity relations exist outside of two dimensions. But it turns out that same line is the radii of the stellated Ecosa dodeca. So now suddenly you have a three-dimensional model where every line towards center on the axial symmetry of dodeca Ecosa is a golden ratio set of intervals on a line, which we prove by equation is the solution to max constructive wave interference, which is by definition the solution to maximum constructive compression. And once you've solved, you've proven what is the geometry of max constructive wave compression, and therefore electric field compression, you have solved the problem of everything. 
problem of gravity, problem of alchemy. The, the solution to the problem of compression is a solution to every basic problem that's ever approached humanity. Whether it's the history of compression, the history of urban design, computers, alchemy, how do you get through death, uh, transmutation. It's all about the solution to compression. And now we've proven by equation how golden ratio is the solution to charge compression. Therefore, why golden ratio phase conjugation is the solution to wave collapse, non-destructive wave collapse. Therefore, how and why golden ratio wave collapse causes gravity, that centripetal force. So then we, we're going to talk later about how that's applied to the technologies Roger's asking about. How do you make propulsions faster than light? We're going to talk about Kosky frost and, and the mercury vortex and the equations we use to optimize. But they're all based on this, the understanding of the wave mechanics. The paper on the right we published second with uh, Martin Jones and myself. First one was with Bill Donovan, the second was with Martin and I. But we again, we take the Klein-Gordon equations and extend what we said about the solution of compression in hydrogen, proven by a new equation, hydrogen radii, to show that this is a generalized solution to the cause of gravity. Therefore, how the longitudinal, the implosive compression rates propagate. And then this fits so beautifully into one of my original teachers, Tom Bearden, who I'm very well, who worked out detailed equations showing how this longitudinal interferometry, sometimes called incorrectly scalar or torsional, is literally what have been called gravity waves. And later he shows that this is also literally gravitobiology. This is what causes growth, the famous longitudinal wave that causes plants to grow in a black basement. Uh, if there's a copper plate on the roof with a wire down. So this, you know, most of you have seen our work on this. Uh, solutions, uh, symptoms of Einstein-induced insanity, not having a clue why objects fall to the ground. Golden ratio recursive constructive heterodyning of phase velocities produces the acceleration of charge towards symmetry center named the gravity. So you do need to have a clue why objects fall to the ground, and this is why. Because golden ratio recursive constructive heterodyning of phase velocities accelerates charge towards center and allows that charge to exit through Planck into a longitudinal. And that's why planets and stars experience gravity relations erotically. And that's why consciousness is so intimately related to center of gravity. To be thinking the speed of light is a speed limit, it's not. Uh, velocities faster than light are routinely measured, centering rather accurately around golden ratio times the speed of light, which is a smoking gun proof of this theory of gravity. Thinking it takes infinite energy to go through the speed of light. No, if you accelerate by golden ratio into a longitudinal array, there are harmonics faster than speed of light by golden ratio. So in the distance, there's a whole series of harmonics faster than light that make that array seem like instantaneous. And that's an introduction to the physics of stargates and portals, that the frequency signature of the send and receive points need to be so intimately matched. And that's another one. Thinking all action at a distance is, sp is spooky, that was an Einstein mistake. Action at a distance is enabled by longitudinal interferometry. We get routine healing at a distance with Theravite.net because they're longitudinal pr projections. And we don't say that's a mystery, we say it's physics. Plant your Therify at a magnetic line cross, or your telepathy, and longitudinal waves are embedded. Plant it at sunrise or sunset, longitudinal rays are planted at equinox. So anytime the four-wave mixing enabled by the perpendicularity of phase conjugation embeds longitudinal waves, you get the possibility of action at a distance, healing at a distance, for example. So, you know, Einstein calling action at a distance spooky, in fact, reflected ignorance of longitudinal interferometry. Not having a clue what the ether is made of, it's simply a charged media that plays like a superfluid in... in believing space-time is somehow bent. It's not. It's just this acceleration of rotation caused by acceleration that causes time to change and not understanding that both time and mass are created by charge rotation. Now, Tesla's mistakes, for example, when he wanted his energy at a distance, he got the frequency signature wrong, didn't phase conjugate, and he got the nodal locations wrong for longitudinal inter interferometry. So obviously he didn't achieve efficient power without wires, as, in fact, the pyramid builders did very well. They were piezo oscillators embedded by the Schumann phase conjugate cascade, piezoelectrically embedding longitudinal waves into the longitudinal grid. So the pyramids were a very useful global power distribution system. They did what Tesla failed. This is just another picture that we talked about. 
we wanted to talk about, now we're getting closer to some of the physics that Roger wanted me to talk about maybe, which was, uh, you know, how the mercury vortex of the Vimana, as Roger mentioned in the intro, made gravity. So here is, visualize this is Schauberger's piezoelectrically doped water vortex about to make voltage from gravity, and it generated so much power, Hitler wrote him a check. The difference in voltage between the outer periphery and the center of that vortex is both the zero point source of the perfect vortex and the source of gravity. So now if you understood this, you could know how the mercury vortex of the Manahanavu made gravity accelerating fast than speed of light. So basically what's happening, first of all, this didn't work if it wasn't piezoelectrically doped as any biodynamic vortex dynamizer could tell you. Uh, but the, the, the difference in voltage potential here is centripetal and here is centrifugal, and that is the literal electric difference between plus and minus charge. So the reason this generates a voltage difference is because this vortex, piezoelectric, is collapsing in an accurate trajectory based on recursion phase conjugation perfected. Therefore, we could predict by equations the dimensions of that vortex, the speed of that vortex, the center point, all of that is predictable by equations to optimize the amount of zero-point energy you will get and the amount of gravity you will get. So this is, again, about the relationship between the rotational and the linear spin. And this is uh, some of the slides we used in Amsterdam. But this is instructive here that when, uh, harking back to the previous lecture on hydrogen, the Joe cell uses concentric tubes, implosive capacitance, and we now know how to tune that to do hydrolysis tickle the fractal hydrogen atom, but there is a clue to energy technologies and gravity technologies. This is actually important for what we want to talk about. This is Cache rather incompetently making gravity by rotating a conjugator inside the rotating ping pong balls here uh, is a nanomaterial. And it's not of sufficient purity to make gravity efficiently. Uh, Cache, I don't think, has the skill. Our group could make the 99% pure needed. Um, but rotating conjugators, we can predict the speed, the velocity, and the geometry. And the optimum geometry is not a sphere, by the way. But he did make some gravity. And to understand how a rotating conjugator makes gravity is part of the subject of the rest of this conversation, because that is a clue. We will use the rotating conjugator metaphor for gravity maker when we look at Kosky Frost and the Hanabu. So this is more pictures of the Hanabu. The, the, Concentric rotating toroid mercury doped with iron, the famous red fluid, is the mechanism of propulsion. And understand how it's actually a highly pressurized, voltage-biased mercury vortex, which is um, spinning. Uh, you have a concentric cylinder spinning the mercury vortex. And it's, you see the mercury has the inertial translation vorticity, but you need the doped iron making it red. There's a special secret sauce which makes the iron powder soluble in mercury. And that gives it the magnetic flux permissivity, which allows you to have the magnetic flux inertia translating vorticity in parallel to the mechanical massive flux uh, translation vorticity in the mass of the mercury. So you need the, both the magnetic density from the iron powder and the mercury. And I must credit uh, Bill Donovan and Elizabeth Donovan on some of this conversation. So once you understand how a vortex makes gravity, you can very quickly know how the Hanabu worked. In the case of Searle, the rotating magnets are just creating a very high DC bias voltage, which is applied to the skin. The big argument here of why it flew, can that propagating ion geometry exist in a vacuum? Some of the skeptics say no. We say yes. This is the homopolar uh, Bruce De Palma's end machine. I knew Bruce very well, and I worked with uh, Tom Vallone on this for many years. Uh, and um, it, it's not directly part of this conversation, but that's that's an example of a magnetic monopole rotating. Notice when Lead Scalman did it, he uses 12 magnets in that a rotating array. Hint, hint, clue, clue. What is phase conjugate magnetics, and why does it make gravity? Elizabeth Rauscher thanked me for inventing phase conjugate magnetics when I actually predicted the equation for what magnetic frequency she used to reduce pain. So implosive magnetics and make gravity, many pictures. And here in the base picture, there are many pictures you can find by research, but of the, of the Hanabu. And, but at the bottom, it's actually two alternately rotating, opposite rotating cylinders, which are spinning the mercury vortex in that particular way. And then it's highly pressurized, and it is a highly DC biased volt. And, uh, if you understood the physics, you see, you know, it, it is a top military secret 
how a vortex makes gravity, but you can't understand how your mind works unless you know how a vortex makes gravity, which is how it gets centripetal. So yes, it's a military secret that a vortex makes gravity. Oh, by the way, you can't understand the mind unless you know that military secret, because your mind is the same kind of vortex. Choosing compassion carefully aligns the magnetic field donuts around the heart so that that nest dodecahedron. So just to visualize that and why it's the Holy Grail. You know, I'm sure everyone here has seen our favorite movies before. Intent creates the future. But revolving that spin path to zero point in the blood, we get the Holy Grail. A cup within a cup, and you noted that the swastika was in there, and in fact, separateness contains that is self-embeds the Sufi heart within heart, feminine reproductive organs. This is a gravity maker, and it's in the blood. <laughs> and if you zoom in, you see the swastika there. So it actually is a magnetic mechanism. And, and you see the golden ratio in the Mandelbrot set. And if you take the simple sine wave in 3D and nest by golden ratio, you get the perfect flame. So you see now we say, the reason you're talking about dodecaecosa is because you're talking about wave implosion of the sine wave. And if you then... You, still like that and you know I, these animations I made thanks to the fancy equipment that Yurka helped us with when I set up the video lab that became Gaia TV. I was uh, having lots of fun with our software there. So this is a model of the dodecastellation and imp implicate gravity wave and this is the dodeca arrangement of masses in the universe. You've all seen that and, and non-destructive charge collapse perfectly modeled in the only way a soap bubble can change scale without changing the ratio, and it really sucks. So this is the, some of the papers. The physicist Andre Lind had agreed how fractality causes gravity, and, um, and El Nashi, I have a whole website about El Nashi, uh, acknowledgement of Scott Olson here. <laughs> You're right, he's a hero. I totally agree. He became so controversial, but really, he was onto it. It's great. Uh, and the lead groups of golden ratio, and so the uh, the Lie group symmetries, it's actually E8 that predicted all the subatomic particles, all based on golden ratio. And it was El Nashi who actually showed that the E8 geometry that uh, Garrett Lisi showed predicted all the subatomic particles, that the E8 was actually almost entirely based on golden ratio. So you and I agree El Nashi was quite a hero in this regard. So here's the top-down view. When you're visualizing accurately how you're going to make gravity in a capacitor, and we're going to show you pictures of capacitors doing this in a minute, but you see what happens is the phase velocities are adding and multiplying recursively using golden ratio, and so not just the wavelengths but the phase velocities, and that's producing acceleration of charge towards center, Planck, and that acceleration of charge implosion towards center, perfected wave collapse, is named gravity, so that's how acceleration towards center is produced from compression only when that compression is golden ratio phase constant. Hence the cause of gravity. I talked about this in the previous lecture. This is the, just the history of the fingerprint of golden ratio being all over hydrogen. I thank Hayrovska, which was a precedent to my work on showing that not only were the golden ratio in the hydrogen ratio between the shells, but the distance to center, that was my addition to that picture of hydrogen, I discovered that if you multiply the plot by golden ratio, you got these radii. That was new information, proving that right to center, hydrogen is fractal based on golden ratio and Planck, and therefore more detail on hydro how hydrogen makes gravity. And by extrapolation, the rest of the atomic table, the DF subshells, etc., are dodecaecosa, so you can see how atoms do golden ratio and therefore make gravity. We have more pictures. So we had many pictures and graphics about how self-similarity causes gravity. The classic conversation is, you know, when Valerie is watching her sainted teacher float and, uh, you know, she floated because she paid her debt to gravity. She made more gravity than the earth underneath her because she became more fractal. Uh, she actually looked at my bumper sticker, which said, get fractal, get dead. So what's happening in the microtubule, the charge collapse, becomes a massive body-wide phenomena, and you indeed make, you, you know, you, you make your own gravity. There's, it's, it, that's very Sufic. <laughs> and so indeed why Kepler was right that the solar system's Geometry is the nest of platonic solids because the nest of close platonic solids is, requires golden ratio. And that's why gravity and how gravity is stabilized. And interestingly, even when the clairvoyance looked at the Anu heart of the sun and saw the same symmetry in the human heart muscle and the same symmetry in the heart of hydrogen, they always saw the same slip knot, seven spin, five spin, the seven spins being tetracubic and the five spins being dodecaecosa, precisely 
what the atomic table is. So the atomic table is perfect nesting, and you all saw this. So this is why atoms make gravity, because not only is the nucleus, all the nuclear hadrons, tetra cube, octa, ecosa, for um, 21st century magazine, and the famous work uh, by chemist Moon, University of Chicago, but also the electron shells, S suborbital, uh, toroidal, the pi suborbital, tetra cubic, there's the seven spins, and then the dodeca, the DF suborbital, 10, 14 electrons, five, seven vortex pair, dodeca ecosa per Armand Weiler. So you get that whole charge collapse per sec perfected is what enables atoms to make gravity because the atomic table is a stellation of platonics because that's the only way you make golden ratio, enable collapse. That's why there is gravity in the atomic table right there. And the clairvoyance taught your children how to, to when you go to your chemistry class, your chemistry teacher must show you this so that you can actually visualize atoms making gravity. And the clairvoyance saw it. You know, it's, it's really sad that our chemistry teachers haven't got there yet because the kids can't be psychokinetic until they can visualize it. So I want to get to more pictures of the technology here. We discussed this. Thank you to Tufan Guven. Here's our early uh, uh, approximations that golden ratio was the maximum constructive interference for waves. Conversely, octaves are maximum destructive interference for waves. That's why tetracubic structures isolate charge and dodeci cosa structures implode charge. It's not that one is good and the other is evil. It's simply that if you want to isolate charge, you use the cubic structure, ice, for example, whereas if you want to implode charge and make a distribution, you use pent golden ratio, every living protein, for example. Here's, Einz, uh, here's um, Nassim tracking golden ratio in all of the major interstellar con uh, constructs, golden ratio in the geometry of uh, the universe. So he did great work there. And this is just briefly to say, here is how DNA makes that golden ratio charge implosion and therefore accelerates the longitudinal out the zipper hydrogen up the center of the DNA helix, making gravity and initiating DNA radio. It's because of this recursive braiding in DNA that the long wave is embedded in the short. Remember, the more broad spectral the golden ratio phase conjugation, the more coherent the longitudinal wave, and therefore the farther the DNA radio reaches and makes gravity. We talked about embedding or nesting. So when physics talks about entanglement, making possible action at a distance, think golden ratio phase conjugation, creating that embeddability and heart rate variability, DNA turning inside out recursively, toroidally, and uh, making, it's called palastration. And so you have the photomicrographs of toroidal DNA imploding. This is our hydrogen Kansas work from the last conversation. So, and, you know, uh, we showed these pictures yesterday in the hydrogen again. The path of hydrogen radii to Planck. This is Elizabeth Donovan holding one of our hydrolysis devices. Again, the last talk here. Pictures from the lab. Uh, hydrogen, hydrogen, oops. Yeah, we, this is the wrong slideshow. Okay. So, but what I did want to show was this. So in that lab, this is the first time we displayed on the spectrum analyzer a wave collapse harmonic series in golden ratio proportion. So suddenly the spectrum analyzer is showing heterodyning based on golden ratio and not an octave. Hello, <laughs> that's, that's fusion enabled. And that's what you need to create the longitudinal wave, which actually is how you tickle hydrogen, as we discussed. So all these, the latest conversation about uh, carbon nanostructures enabling, and now when later we talk about rotating carbon nano to make gravity, you get a clue here. And this is Garrett Lisi, E8. We just talked about that. If you take all the symmetries of E8, as Al Nashi showed, based on golden ratio, you can model the entire subatomic zoo. Nesting and uh, compassion, uh, golden ratio in the solar system, golden ratio in gravity relations. This is nice to just think about that the nutation precession of the equatorial plane of the Earth to the uh, solar system's equator, to the galactic equator, when those precessional relations reach golden ratio embeddability, gravity is stabilized. There's reasons why the local rotation has to embed by golden ratio in stellar rotations for gravity stability to exist. So it's a deeply implicate of the physics of astrology. For example, why the nodal latitudes of the pyramid array on Earth and Mars are tetrahedral, 
because they called it planet taming or atmosphere maintenance, but you have to stabilize the Earth spin fractally with embeddability in the galactic and solar system spin in order to stabilize gravity and therefore hold atmosphere. It's deeply intuitive, uh, deeply instructive on the nature of planet taming as described in that famous book that these, some of these visuals are from the book Two Thirds, David Meyer and David Percy. So now, Roger, here we are. This, is, this was your question. How, how, do you make, how do you make gravity? So this is now a credit uh, Elizabeth Donovan from the uh, book Glimpses of Epiphany, which uh, you can see a major part of this, thanks to Elizabeth Donovan, at our website on gravity, fractalfield.com slash propulsion. And a whole book from Glimpses of Epiphany, thanks to Bill Donovan. Uh, this is a quartz crystal uh, rod, a quartz crystal hexagonal, and you, uh, if it's doped toward a phase conjugate dielectric, for example, uh, lithium niobate, which is why Scotty in Star Trek had his dilithium crystals, they called this form of propulsion warp. It was because you take this helical array and you use a phase conjugate pump wave, and in this case it was documented, it made 800 times its own weight in gravity. Now the reason that quartz crystal made eight times its own weight in gravity, Kosky Frost, is because of a rotating conjugator. Okay, so in other words, I've got the, the helical, the reason the piezoelectric quartz crystal is piezo is because the vertical z-axis is helical, and therefore, then when you pump a phase conjugate RF pump wave into it, you're rotating a conjugator. This was called warp power in Star Trek. So there's more on this, this is a glimpse of epiphany, many pictures of this. But I just want to give you a, a, a background, a flavor for uh, you rotate a conjugator, you get gravity, and you see, if you do this with enough plasma density, then you carry your own inertial field with you, and you can make right turns at a thousand miles an hour, no problem, and you disobey Einstein's laws about taking infinite power to go through the speed of light, wrong. <laughs> so I, I'm suggesting, and, and this is Elizabeth Donovan's uh, more recent website, in which uh, she presents work, and uh, Elizabeth Donovan is with us in this conference series, uh, old friend and uh, Roger, so he will say more. But the point is that rotating conjugator makes gravity warp power. This is an example. It's practical. It's measurable. It goes through the speed of light. Uh, this is uh, an introduction to, to maybe we should cover this first. The more simple, what was called impulse power on Star Trek. Impulse power is basically vortex propulsion. And to get an idea how vortex propulsion works, you can look at the asymmetric, the uncompensated loop. And it's simply the Irish knot. Will actually, you can actually make some gravity by rotating a fluid or charge in these structures. And we've measured and optimized and uh, created some equations around this. And, but is, this is a, I wouldn't call it an efficient way of making gravity, but it's instructive to the physics. Again, all at fractalfield.com slash propulsion, and definitely this is credit to Elizabeth Donovan. So he and I, in the backyard, <laughs> hooking up our $1,000 pump in order to get enough inertia <laughs> and measure the propulsion. <laughs> and by the way, we learned later that our friends did this with an aquarium pump instead of a $1,000 pump because they doped the liquid and, and, and if you use uh, if you use iron iron filings in your mercury, but there's more efficient ways. And so this is called a non-compensated loop measuring gravity. So later we actually get to the point where we and this I must credit Martin Jones who wrote the papers with us and did the equations. So if you take that spiral on the tor torus, hint Schauberger, hint the mercury vortex in Hanabu, uh, Vimana, and you optimize the translation of vorticity in that spiral, you can actually predict by equation, and again, credit Martin Jones working with us, with Elizabeth Donovan, you can predict in advance what geometry of that spiral equation, whether it's fluid or magnetic, whether the vortex is fluid or magnetics. Either way, you can predict which geometry by radii will optimize translation of vorticity, and hence the amount of gravity you make, propulsion. And this is the output of some of Martin Jones' equations showing here's the sweet spot right there. So the ratio of the inner turn to the outer turn predicts when the vortex implodes. The point is this is not a mystery. We can actually look at the equations for how this happened. So some of these slides are in here just because uh, uh, when the Ark of the Covenant was a 
was not only just an implosive capacitor, was not only used for making Holy Communion because it could stabilize the monatomic gold at the uh, conjugate arc. Uh, and you can also, this is a metaphor for how we purify water with aquify and therify in the sp uh, fractal spark gap. Remember, Tesla started with a fractal spark gap. Carbon arc was the beginning of his life. <laughs> so, but also that this was called the, in the ancient of days, it was called the, the um, the mono, the mono machine, the transportable one with the tanks, well, there was a certain showbread which uh, facilitates this sulfur, which made the gold powder edible. And that's indirectly related to this conversation because the gold powder is part of the, nan the nanomaterial which you rotate to make a conjugator. So, in fact, this is a conjugator. And not only did the Ark of the Covenant, ori original purpose from the Syrians was to reduce radioactivity, which it did well, implosive capacitance, and even Keshe succeeded with reducing radioactivity with implosive capacitance, nanomaterials. But it was a gravity maker, <laughs> instrument of war. And so uh, um, uh, some of those pictures are the translation of vorticity and making the point that, oh, your heart muscle is doing the same thing. You make your own gravity. It's that perfect vortex, the flame letter, the original alpha, alphabet of the heart, and our work on vorticity and the origin of alphabets, you've all seen that work. And uh, so they have, the, the ancient sacred alphabets were about this principle of gravity making. Okay, so let's see, we're at slide number 132. Uh, I wanted to go here about the LIGO. So uh, the point I'm making is that instead of measuring gravity waves by the slight change in mass slash gravitational attraction between two remote objects to measure when the star explosion light years away happened, which does connect faster than light in some occasions, uh, it's better to use a 25 cent capacitor once you understand that that gravity wave is in fact a longitudinal wave and there's a way to pick up longitudinal waves by an array of capacitance. And this relates directly to our discussion about Einstein uh, saying uh, dark, the concept of dark matter is fundamentally a mistake. That if we look back here, here is the picture proving the arrangement of masses in the universe of dodecaecosa, namely conjugate recursion. So at these centers of gravity fitting golden ratio conjugate recursion, there will be more gravity. So in fact, when physicists say we got way too much gravity in the universe given the mass that's here. Therefore, there must be something else. Let's call it dark matter. Uh, no, thank you. No, let's call it the symmetry which makes extra gravity and dunk this stupid idea of dark matter. <laughs> so there is no evidence for the existing dark, dark matter. It's the only evidence is we got too much gravity to go around. And the reason we got too much gravity to go around is because masses are arranged in a fractal. Hello. Other examples of gravity maker, implosive capacitance make gravity, thanks to uh, Townsend Brown and then now Dan. And this is an example of a gravity maker, a, a jet tower as implosive capacitance. It's it literally a plasma projector. And so the raising of the jet and the Jedi is one who can project their plasma. These are gravity makers. If you want to be a Jedi, you must know how to make gravity. <laughs> Making gravity is a political statement, just like growing a garden. <laughs> So paying your debt to gravity. These are arrays of capacitors which have amazing, amazing qualities. Implosive capacitance is so fun. <laughs> and it's not even expensive to play with this. And implosive capacitance is a political taboo because it could make you independent. You could have your own body polis. Oh, that's the definition of politics. Hello. This is a, actually, this is a picture of a cone which is about three feet tall from the top. And if you place the capacitors on the cone in fractality, you could make gravity. Hello. And these are examples from capacitive arrays from a warp drive engine. These are some of our experiments about phase conjugate dielectrics, implosion, gravity. Okay, so now I think that's about the end of that section. We talked about the devices here. We don't need to talk about the imploder today. Uh, oh yeah, here is This is our research in phase conjugate magnetics which is another introduction to gravity. These are 3,000 Gauss magnets in a dodeki cosa, very unusual qualities. And here is Elizabeth Rauscher's power spectra of the magnetic field that reduced pain measurably. And here I applied my equation, very top in red, and showed the main harmonics of the phase conjugate magnetics that reduce pain in her FDA trials. In fact, were golden ratio times Planck, my discovery, 
And this is when she thanked me for inventing phase conjugate magnetics when I showed her this plot. Credit to Elizabeth Rauscher, who sadly is no longer with us, but worked with us for many years, including with uh, Jean-Paul Viberian, as Roger mentioned, in Marseille. So this is capacitive as, as electric formative forces and gravity informative forces. So you see how the geometry of gravity is critical to making a seed germinate. It's because if it's not centripetal, it's dead. If the seed can't suck, it cannot attract its first nutrient. It won't germinate. So etheric formative forces, forces are implosive capacitance. And that then introduces beautifully what Paul spoke about. What Paul spoke about, about why Therify is so good for seeds. You know, Paul didn't even talk about the fact that I had this drastic, excited phone call from this marijuana grower in Western Canada saying, I've been zapping my seeds with the Therify and I'm going to keep this a secret because my hemp growth is three to five hundred <laughs> percent. And, and, I, and I, I begged him for a formal report. He says, no, 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 this is going to be a secret over here. <laughs> but you see, later we find out that actually pyramid arrays, one of the major reasons for making them in stone circles, was to make the implosive capacitance to cause a seed to grow. You know, it's also about projecting your aura and lucid dream, but it's about making a seed grow. So that gravity, which is implosive, is so fertile because it, it actually feeds the consciousness of the seed, for example. And that enables the seed to participate in the DNA radio. So I'm sure Roger wanted me to talk about, well, how do we commercialize this? <laughs> was, that, was that the question, Roger? <laughs> Yeah, you got you just you've got you got sixty seconds to commercialize it. <laughs> well, you know, every government on the planet is trying to steal this, and every government on the planet is willing to kill to steal this. Let's be clear. <laughs> Hello, every government on planet Earth. Uh, but yet, at the same time, they know that rotating conjugators make every other form of en energy and propulsion on this planet look like the Stone Ages. And you know, we have partners. It's a long story. But point being that once you start with the basics, showing how implosive capacitance, and they're using implosive capacitance on the edges of the wings to make the aircraft fly faster. And uh, uh, actually, Roger was involved in one of those technologies, implosion on the tip of the wing to create gravity in the wingtip. Well, that's actually being done with capacitance on wingtips in the advanced military. But if you know the equations for how implosive capacitance makes gravity, you can do that much more radically and much more efficiently. However, the reason we're having this conversation in the spiritual context is because when you do the remote viewing, the astral travel, the lucid dreaming, the travel after death, remember Therify Dead Net is so famous for lucid dreaming, you are doing propulsion to accelerate your longitudinal projection, your Kesjan body as it were, through the speed of light into inhabiting that array. So once you understand what enables your aura to implode and plasma project, you can do this more intelligently. You can understand that your lucid dream is going to be better, more coherent, if you were at a magnetic cross point. Your lucid dream is going to be better if, you know, if you sang the song of that song line, which is a frequency signature, etc. So all the, the physics of action at a distance forever. So we're laying the groundwork for a future set of projects about fractal gravitational pr propulsion but the real advanced work in this regard will come when we have more high-level people involved in our groups. And, and those people are with us now, and we're just waiting for... <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, we have funding, we have support, we're doing kind of good. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, we, we've run out of time, so we won't be able to do any specific questions right now. What I suggest you do is if you've got questions, put them down in the chat window. And uh, Dan, you're around just before maybe Paul uh, is doing his pre presentation uh, after, just after lunch. Um, are you around then? Yes, I think I won't sure. get, it'll be about three or four hours before sleep here, but there's, yeah, probably, yes, yes. <laughs> I think it's about two hours away. Yeah, um, yeah, that should be. So yes, if to. there's any questions about this, put them into the chat window. We'll have, we'll be able to have like a 10 minute uh, session there uh, before uh, Paul starts. Um, now we've got Phil Group. Thanks everybody.